Hello, Mark Pearson, Executive and Artistic Director of the College Light Opera Company. Welcome to Off the Clock, a weekly program where I get to interview notable clock alums. Off the Clock is made possible through a generous gift from Hope Lincoln Baker. This week, I was fortunate to get a chance to talk to Dr. Kim Kowalki, President and CEO of the Kurt Vile Foundation of Music. Let's hear what he had to say. Great. Anyways, uh, Kim Kowalki, I'm so thrilled that you could join us uh, today um, and talk to us a little bit about uh, your career and your time at Clock. Uh, for our, our listeners, viewers, can you just uh, tell us uh, who you are and um, a little bit about your career? Well, uh, as you said, I'm Kim Kowalki, and uh, I just retired after 43 years of university teaching, nine years at Occidental College, and uh, then 34 at the University of Rochester and the Eastman School of Music here in Rochester. And at, in both of those jobs, I taught music history, but I and I was a musicologist, but I also was able to conduct and I had a musical theater workshop at both institutions in both cases that I founded. And so I, I think of that part of my career as being the best possible combination where I didn't have to give up performance and I didn't have to just do research and teach. I could keep making music and doing musical theater and be a career musicologist. So, I was, I, I was very fortunate in that. During most of that period, from 1981 on, I've also been president and CEO of the Kurt Bile Foundation in New York, which had been founded in the 60s, but was largely dormant until Lada Lenya, Bile's widow, passed away in 1981. And a few weeks before she died, she called me to New York from LA and asked if I would take over as president of the foundation. And I basically declined and said, I don't know anything about copyrights and contracts and administering a catalog. And she, um, she was dying at the time of cancer. And she said, you are the only one who's never asked me for anything. So you're the only one I can trust. And I said, how can I refuse when you put it like that? And so I said, I'll try my best. And so it's been now, I guess this will be 40 years coming up as in that role. And I never get tired of it. There are always new challenges and new projects and so forth. Great. I have to ask you a question. Um, you, you mentioned your your work as a, as a teacher and with music history. I've, I've heard rumors that you were famous for uh, a particular test, um, a, a ne needle drop test, I think it's <laughs> called, uh, could, uh, maybe infamous is the word. Could you explain to us what that is? Yes, well, I expect the, the students who, who studied with me, it was mainly standard repertory from mid 18th century, uh, starting with say, uh, Mozart, Haydn, Beethoven, up through contemporary, but Generally, this is the bread and butter for anybody who's an educated musician. And so we did what was, uh, we emphasized what was called structural listening. So it wasn't just memorize the first eight bars or the, or the main tunes. Uh, they, I'd play sort of the end of the development going into the recap of the sonata form, and they had to tell not just composer, piece, movement, but where in the movement they were and what was the structural function of this. And when I resigned from Occidental to take the University of Rochester job, um, the faculty gave me a going away party. And the climax of the party, and I bet you got this from Dave Weiler, who was one of my students at Occidental. And, <laughs> and uh, I was given a listening quiz in the uh, manner that I administered them to my students. The only problem was that the examples were all played backwards. So that I had to recognize the passage as it occurred in reverse notes <laughs> and it's amazing that that most of the time it's still recognizable uh, i i thought at first that i wouldn't get a single one right but it wasn't that bad but 
because it was, I'll never forget the, being put on the, the chair like that. <laughs> uh, that Weiler came to, to clock with me in 1979. That year I brought 13 people who were from Occidental. And I, it's great that Weiler is still associated and you know became a, a real fixture. He, was a, he came as a, an accompanist that year. So, yeah, can you tell us a little bit about your association with Clock, uh, how, that, how that began? My first season was 1974, and I saw that uh, Don Tull had resigned, and uh, they were looking for another principal conductor, and so I applied and um, sent tapes of some of my performances, and at that point they were reel to reel, that's how far back it was. And uh, the next thing I knew, Don Tull asked if he could come to see one of my rehearsals of the Greater New Haven Youth Symphony, which I conducted at the time, and he did. And then a few days later, B called, uh, B has been called and offered me the job. And so I only had, I think, about two or three months to to get ready for this. And I was full-time grad student at Yale trying to find a dissertation subject and so forth. And, and I recall that um, I was assigned Flater Mouse, followed by Brigadoon, followed by Annie Get Your Gun, followed by Princess Ida and uh, with two weeks in between. And the Flater Mouse, my God, was that a trial by, by fire, you know, uh, Flater Mouse in a week, come on. Uh, fortunately, at that point, the company had quite a few older young professionals. Barry Buzzy came in from Minnesota Opera, Martha Thigpen left and went to the match, you know, and so they, they were, uh, Eisenstein and Rosalinda, and so they came in knowing the roles, and so it was much, uh, much easier, but then the Freimeyers directed that. Uh, that season, I think, still holds the clock record for the longest tech rehearsal in the history of the company, and that was because Roger Brunier, who directed and you get your gun, who went on to become a very good opera director at Peabody and so forth, but he had never done American musical theater. He didn't know what to do with the musical. So that tech rehearsal uh, lasted till 4 a.m. when B finally called it, and it wasn't done. And part of the problem was we'd get to a certain point in the show, and he'd say, okay, next scene, and timid hands would go up and say, uh, Mr. Brunier, we haven't blocked that scene yet. <laughs> so that became an infamous moment in clock history. Yeah, and I think that's also, if I, if I remember my clock history correctly, that was when we first uh, uh, introduced the two o'clock drop dead rule for tech. Right. So. Yep, it was, that was the, the uh, motivation for that, that yeah, rule. So, so in fact, that... And, that uh, record should now be impossible to break. <laughs> the, yeah. That season also had one of my most embarrassing moments conducting a show because I was, I was um, in the National Guard Army Band as a way to uh, avoid going full time in the military at the height of the Vietnam War. I was fortunate to have a place in, a, in the Connecticut Band. But summer camp came in the middle of the clock season. And so for two weeks, I was supposed to be in two places at once, uh, touring Connecticut with the band and being at, on the Cape. I had a great warrant officer who said, come to the concerts that we're putting on whenever you can. Just, you know, you'll drive a lot, but you'll be able to do both. And so I remember the, one of the weeks was performances of Annie Get Your Gun, and I would drive down to Connecticut after the, the curtain came down in Falmouth, and then I'd drive back to the concert in the afternoon and get into the pit at, at Falmouth um, at clock in time for the, for the downbeat. But this, I didn't get much sleep those weeks. And I remember uh, that we were in the middle of Annie Get Your Gun and Sitting Bull 
who was supposed to be chanting at that point, started chanting, Kowalki Kim, Kowalki Kim, Kowalki Kim. And because I'd fallen asleep in the pit and I missed the cue to start the next music, Number. And I jumped up, and, uh, you know, and <laughs> down me. It only happened once, but I, I learned that I, I uh, probably should have gotten more sleep then. And, uh, but I did it the next year, too. Um, when the 75, uh, my first show was Merry Widow. That was my first show with my friend John Lucas. I didn't know him at all at that point. And um, after that, I think I only did two shows with any other director, and he, we became lifelong friends. He was the godfather of my son, and, you know, talk about wonderful um, side benefits that accrued from the clock experience. It was that sort of friendship. Well, that's, that's wonderful. My next question was going to be, um, are you still in contact with, with folks that you met at, uh, at CLOCK? John's no longer with us, but um, are there other folks that you, you still keep in contact with? Oh, sure. Um, not as many as um, there used to be. I think uh, we've lost some touch, but Andy Einhorn was my assistant for Most Happy Fella in 2000 two I guess and uh, we became really close friends and I'm you know we're in touch all the time and and a lot of the uh, clock alums have served in some capacity with on various panels and juries at the Kurt Bio Foundation for the Lotto Lenya competition so Ted Sperling um, I see Annalisa Lemming, who wants to be a judge as soon as she gets old enough <laughs> to, to be believable in that role. But uh, so the, a lot of the alums who have gone through the Lenya competition are, are still friends. It, that's a great transition to my, my next question, which was going to be about, um, you know, clock and shaping careers. But I think you have a very interesting um, example of that where there's so much uh, overlap with folks with the foundation and people who either you know you may have uh, come in contact with through clock or have a peripheral clock connection um, can you tell us a little bit first about the lot Lenya competition though because um, some folks may not know what what that is and and how that came to be Sure. Um, I started the Lenya competition in 1998, which was the centenary of Lada Lenya's birth. And she was not known to be a versatile opera singer, Broadway actress, but she, she was an iconic performer of her own. And, 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 and an un unmistakable voice. I mean, you, <laughs> yes, you know, absolutely. You know, it taste is one thing, but you hear that voice and you know, that's Lada Lenya. And she never had pitch problems. She, could, she had a great ear, but she just didn't have a, a trained, legitimate sound. Anyway, she had, she had left the foundation, the copyrights of Bile, but we didn't, and we did everything for Kurt Bile and for his legacy. And I said, it's her centenary. Let's do something that honors her. And so uh, it started out in 98 um, as just a local contest at Eastman. We had a little festival. We brought the manuscripts over from, from Vienna to be in Sibley Music Library so that they would be better protected. And uh, I remember I invited Teresa Stratus and Julius Rudell and Mark Cuddy, who's a director, and we had a panel of a conductor and performer and a uh, director. And uh, that model, as the competition grew first to be tri-state and then it became national and then it became, now it's completely international and um, entrants from all over the world and finalists from all over the world. But um, in the beginning, the whole purpose of the competition was to try to encourage versatility in young performers. Uh, I was so tired of hearing Kiri Teikanawa sing all the musical theater roles she should have never touched. You know, she's a great singer, but it's like having Ethel Merman sing The Ring to have uh, opera singers sing West Side Story with, a, with a, an accent, you know, and the wrong accent. Uh, and so basically I said, we're going to have a competition where if you do an opera aria, 
then you sing that idiomatically, and then you do two musical theater pieces, one contemporary, one golden age, you do those differently, and the same for the Kurt Bile piece that, that you're required to sing. So that repertoire requirement of four contrasting genres and bring, bring the goods that those uh, pieces require, uh, that's become the unique um, um, what the characteristic of and and really the demands of the competition and so it's been rare when a winner of the Metropolitan Opera auditions also wins the Lenya competition but it has happened twice actually and those people were were really pretty remarkable when they could do both things so well. I think it's very I mean I, I've had the privilege to to attend uh, some of the finals and what really strikes me uh, as exciting about it is it, it I see a very strong connection with the work we do at Clock with the work that the the Lotta Lenya competition does almost on, on a concentrated level you know we try to help folks come out as full rounded performers and um, and feel comfortable in those different genres so I, I definitely see um, I don't know if, if you also have noticed that, but I think there's a certain um, overlap in, in mission between clock and, and the competition. I don't think I would have uh, designed the competition the way I did without the clock experience informing how I view training musical theater uh, performers. And that certainly those values um, also informed my musical theater workshops at, at both institutions. And so I like to think of the best of the alums from clock and from musical theater workshops as being groomed for the La Delenia competition. Usually the winners are a little older, not always, but certainly we want to identify talented young performers when they're at the age to be at CLOT, which is one of the reasons the foundation has established the violinia members of the vocal company. And we're delighted to have this meaningful sort of um, um, way to fulfill. One of the central missions of the foundation is to nurture uh, young talent in the study, performance, and creation of musical theater. And we think Clock is, is a perfect example of ways that we can help nurture young musical theater talent. And I, we should mention, I think some of, the, some of the competition is available online, right, for viewing? Yes, the finals are, um, online on we the foundation has its own youtube channel and if you uh just type in la delenia competition you'll get many years of finals and and uh, certainly the top three winners will be there also you can do it from the foundation's website which is very simple kwf.org and uh you can click on anyone uh and you can even probably recognize some of the familiar names from the clock rosters over the years. You can see Annalisa Lemming's performances uh, when she won second prize in the competition. Uh, so definitely. Um, the other really great thing about the competition that I never expected was that by having the sorts of judges that we're able to get, whether it's Vicki Clark or it's, or it's uh, Hal Prince uh, or Ted Chapin, uh, people get discovered by these judges and they open doors. So then Annalisa, when Ted judged her, uh, he said, you know, Annalisa, at the party afterwards, he says, you know, there's a, there's a Sound of Music tour that's casting in the next month or two. I'm, I'm going to make sure you get seen for it. And she, she got the standby for Maria and that organization used her. And that was, she was going to go to graduate school in opera at Cincinnati. And she, her whole career path took a, a left turn as a result of that meeting with Ted Chapin. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's um, one of the most exciting things about uh, things like the competition clock as well, where it's those residual or accidental encounters that result in a complete 
uh, trajectory change or career change. And only because institutions like the Kurt Weill Foundation exist, are those opportunities there for artists to have, you know, and it might be a cocktail party after a competition, like you said, but that's, those are those important moments where you meet someone, um, you come in contact with someone, and, and even if it's just the planting of a seed of an idea, but um, I, I, think, um, I think that's a, a, a really great example. You had mentioned um, about it's rare that someone may win the Met and win the Lenya. And um, I think I know what you're saying there, but can you flesh that out a little bit, maybe as you mentioned with the judges, but what are they looking at or how are they looking at performers? Is it a different way, something else they're looking for or why is there a difference there? Well, I realize that there's a huge difference in the way people evaluate performance when Teresa Stratus and Julius Rudell sat next to each other. And Teresa was on the edge of her seat watching the people as well as listening. And Julius was reclining back with his eyes closed during all the performances, listening only to the sound. And I talked to him about it, and, and uh, I said, what's it like going into the pit of the Vienna Staatsoper and knowing that you won't have any rehearsal, you're, you're just going to be plugged in as a conductor, you won't have ever worked with anyone on the stage? He said, oh, it's exciting. And I said, well, how do you know where they are on stage? He said, oh, I never look at the stage. <laughs> And so that sort of sums it up. When, if you ever saw the documentary about the, the um, Met finals about five, six years ago, the, the judges talked about nothing but voice. Uh, you know, voice, voice, voice. And, and the, the two winners of the Met who also won the millennia competition said the same thing, that that it's, it's much more difficult for them to prepare for the Lenya competition with this variety of acting and vocal techniques and skills and uh, different idioms than simply to do the voice object thing. And so that's the main difference. I'm not saying one is better than the other, but, uh, but I, do th I do think that, that we gladly have for the most part, superseded this notion that an operatic voice singing Anything Goes is not necessarily better than Ethel Merman singing Anything Goes. In fact, probably not as, as good as we, uh, Glimmerglass does um, musicals, at least one every summer. And some of them have been really well cast and successful and and others you know you do annie get your gun and uh, you have an annie who won't belt that's a problem it's not the way the music was written so can you uh just uh for clear clarification um can you you don't have to explain but but what do you mean by belt versus an, an opera song uh, well a belt sound is you might think of it as a human trumpet sound it's it's a very brassy right in the mask and it's and it's using the the nasal resonating cavities most people today who have careers that last in the 60s uh, when they're still singing as 65 years old like Judy Kay for example you know a 40 some year career and she's still pretty much singing all the, the range that she ever had. She talks about it being a mix, that it's not a chest voice and it's not a head voice, it's this mix. And you, you mix it in, uh, in the golden age, a belt range was from about a G below middle C until up to the C above middle C. So it was only an octave and a fourth or fifth. And you didn't carry the belt up higher because that's when you get into really um, treacherous terrain in terms of the voice. And now, however, ever since miking came in and you have defying gravity, now they're defying the belt range. And, and we even have what's called hyper belt, where people build up to E's and F's. And I, I have to say, it makes my, my skin crawl because I just think that these singers are going to last about three or four years, and, and you, can, you can hear it when they're doing it, even with mics. 
Yeah, it's a, it's an excellent point um, that you bring up the health of, of singing. And I think um, often uh, someone who isn't necessarily in that world or industry uh, maybe doesn't think so much about it. But, you know, you as you compare to a, a trumpet to the voice, you if you break your trumpet, um, that's sad, but you can go acquire another trumpet. If you if you break your voice, that's uh, that's a problem. And, it uh, is. And a, and a career ending problem. So. Yeah. Annalisa Lemming, when we, after she won, we, we had a professional development grant available to previous winners, and she asked for a grant so that she could study with the teacher to teach her to belt healthily. And she says that was the best investment that she made in her career, because otherwise she would have been very limited. She wouldn't have been eligible for a lot of Broadway roles, and she says she uses it every day now. Do, do you remember who her, her teacher was? I don't. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. I'll, I, I will ask her. <laughs> uh, speaking of um, professional uh, development and profession, um, would you say that uh, the competition is, uh, the Left Lender competition is, is what you're proudest of or your legacy? Or, or is there something else uh, looking back at your career that sticks out to you as a uh, particular moment? Well, I always, when someone asks me that question, I always think of Sondheim and Sunday in the Park with George, where Dot sings children in art. The only thing that we leave behind that is actually worthwhile are children in art. And so I do have a son, uh, but I, I'm not a creative um, maker of art in the sense of a composer or a lyricist. So I think what my legacy might be, certainly I'm proud of the Lenya competition, but I also started the Kurt Bile edition, which is the critical edition of all Kurt Bile's works. And that might have been expected, but um, this the spin-off of that was that the, these were the first times that works of the American musical theater were given that sort of scholarly attention to actually figure out what was played on Broadway and what revisions went through for the tours. And then you, you actually make available authoritative scripts and scores and piano vocal scores that match. Can and get, now that has become a model for the Gershwins and for Kiss Me Kate. And it's, been, it's, it's had some real uh, ripple effects. So I'm, can, I'm proud of that. Can, can you explain to us um, what a critical edition is and why that's a necessity? I think a lot of folks may not understand that you know, if you hear a show or you know, if you were privileged to hear a show uh, on Broadway in, in the 60s, it may not be what you're going to hear the next time you hear it. Two examples. When I, actually three, when I came to clock after a hiatus of almost 22 years and last year was 79 and then my life just got so busy I didn't come back until 2001 when B and Urs were at uh, Lucas's retirement party at Brown with me and they said you guys need to do a show together how about Titanic <laughs> and Lucas and I looked at each other and said oh yeah right on the Highfield theater stage and by the end of the party, I guess we had quite a bit to drink because we said yes. And when uh, we got the rehearsal material for Titanic, this huge, uh, you know, orchestra and choral show, and uh, we, we were, I was supposed to conduct it from the piano vocal score. And, and that was typical of Broadway uh, musicals when you rented the, the parts. You spent most of rehearsal trying to figure out who's supposed to be playing and why something is missing because there weren't any orchestral scores that showed the conductor what the orchestra was supposed to be doing. And so fortunately, I went to Yale with Maury Yeston. And so I said, Maury, do you have a photocopy of your, your full score that I could borrow? And he, he said, no, I don't, but the orchestrator, Jonathan Tunick, does, and, and I'll get it to you. So I had Maury's uh, photocopy of Maury's score for them. The next year, we did Most Happy Fellows. Same thing, a piano vocal score for this three-hour show that's almost continuous music, and to do that in a week. So I didn't know how to get a full score for that until Joe Lesser, Frank Lesser's widow, came to the show. 
And after she, she liked it so much, she invited me to lunch in New York later that fall. And she said, what'd she use to conduct from? And I said, the piano vocal score. She went to her bookcase in her apartment and said, here's Frank's full score, Bowed. You could have, you could have used this. And then the next one, the next year was Sweeney Todd. John and I introduced Sondheim to Clock for the first time in 79 with company. And then we introduced Sweeney Todd. And because we're crazy, we do these things that you, <laughs> you know, it couldn't be done. So when we got the Sweeney Todd material, nothing matched anything. There, there were, I, I think I, um, kept a record of how many mistakes were in the parts and in the piano vocal score. And I think I came up with 730 mistakes in it. And I said, this is one of those shows that everybody does, and yet the material is terrible. And so that was the inspiration for me to say, we can do this differently and to have uh, authoritative scores based on all the surviving sources, that then match the cues for dialogue and where the placement in the scenes and so forth. And you have to choose the various versions because so many shows had things changed out of town in tryouts or cut during a run. And so how do you handle this? And we spent about four years just trying to think through the guidelines that would inform this. And that's what has helped other um, composers' legacies um, now come up with viable editions that make everyone's life so much easier for for performing these shows. I'm sure I, Clock has used the Kiss Me Kate one, right? Yeah, I, I think that's one of the best explanations of it that that I've heard, and and I'm assuming a lot of our listeners will will have the same feeling I have, which is it's a lot like restoration work. You know, you have yes. to. Uh, it is not. It, there is a lot of art to that science, and you have to make decisions about, like you said, out of out of town tryouts. Things are cut. Things are added. You know, where do you pause it to say this is the most definitive version of this? And and in many ways, you you can't. But you say this is this is what we think is the is the best way that this works. And then usually, critical editions then have you know the. Uh, other material like would you if you were to reinsert song x it would go here and this is how you could kind of make that work um uh, you know key change notwithstanding or figure that out on your own but um exactly with the kurt bow edition we decided that that first of all we wouldn't include anything that wasn't orchestrated and nothing that wasn't at least rehearsed and then we have a main text which is sort of the editor's best notion of what the show is or was meant to be. And then we have an appendix with all this extra material that is then made available with parts and so forth. So that uh, it really is a practical and a scholarly enterprise. And it's no accident that in some cases, editors, it's rare that anyone can do it in less than three to five years. And Bruce McClung, who did Lady in the Dark, um, must have spent 20 years researching it, you know, tracking down every cast member, tracking down the assistant stage manager to get the actual script that was used in rehearsals for the Broadway production. So, you know, you, you could make a life um, uh, work, a Lebensverk of, of collecting the material for, for a critical edition. And we try to do that for the editors as much as possible. Right, right. Uh, so this next question is um, maybe maybe a difficult one to to answer, but how if someone were to want to have a career resembling yours, how would they go about um, doing that, or what would be that trajectory? My wife says you have to be in the right place so that things will drop into your lap. <laughs> And she says, you have been the luckiest person. And, and in many ways, that's true that, you know, I, uh, I graduated from McAllister with a double major in math and music, and I didn't know what I was going to do. 
and I decided I'd apply to Yale, and I didn't even know what musicology was. I thought it had something to do with music, and uh, found out that when I got there that they didn't really think so, that performance was a waste of time, and so I had to sort of keep that a secret, but uh, I got to go to Yale uh, only because I got this draft notice on the day I graduated from college, and I had a friend who was a bassoonist in the Minnesota National Guard band, and he said, what are you doing about the draft? We were playing bassoon next to each other in the Minneapolis Civic Orchestra, and I said, I don't know. And he said, well, I'm moving up to warrant officer. The bassoon chair will be open. Do you want it? And you couldn't get in the National Guard in 1970. And, he, and it saved my life, basically. And so that was one time it dropped in my lap. The next time was that um, I was walking down the street in New Haven thinking about what am I going to do for a dissertation? And I walked past the, the, um, the Yale rep and I heard this noise coming out and it turns out it was Kurt Vile, uh, Seven Deadly Sins in Mahogany. And I went in the back of the theater, snuck in and I sat in the back row because I'd never heard Vile that I knew of. And I like to t tell people that I just am still sitting in that back row. I was so fascinated that I did my dissertation on it and I've spent my career working on this composer's music. And I guess the other major uh, uh, thing that fell in my lap was where I, uh, when I decided to do my dissertation on vial, I contacted the British scholar, David Drew, who had, who had uh, been working on vial for a long time and I, I wanted to make sure that I would be welcome and how should I maneuver, he's been working on this big book. He said, I'll be in New York on such and such a date in June, come to East 55th Street, and apartment 13F, and I'll meet with you there, we'll talk. So I did, I buzzed in 13F, I went up in the elevator, and I buzzed the, the doorbell, and the door opened, and there's Lotta Wagner. And she says, you must be Mr. Kowalka. And I said, yes. And she said, I'm, I said, Lenya, I know who you are. <laughs> and she said, well, then what kind of ice cream do you like? And I said, I, any kind. She said, good, I go get ice cream, you and David talk. And David and I talked and that was my beginning of, a, that was 74. So for the next seven years, I was in touch with her as I was doing my dissertation. and. And uh, it led to my being the president of the foundation and changed my life. So I was in the right place at the right time. And I always tell Liz, my wife, yeah, but you have to have your eyes open. Yeah, you have to be ready to receive it. No, that's a, that's a good point. Um, I, it would be remiss of me not to ask, since we are in the middle of a pandemic, um, what have you been doing with yourself uh, since since lockdown and, and everything? And I know you're recently retired from teaching. Well, I, the Kurt Vile Foundation is still working full time. Uh, all seven full time employees were working remotely. We have Zoom meetings uh, several times a week. And we have a number of projects that have been deferred for so long because we didn't have time to do them or we didn't have the motivation to do them. So we've started all sorts of exciting new initiatives this summer and we're going full throttle. I thought I would be twiddling my thumbs, but I, I haven't gotten the articles done that are due you know, t two months ago. And I, I, every morning I wake up feeling guilty and, and because I'm, I'm neglecting my own writing. But uh, one of the most exciting projects is the, what we call the Lenya Songbook Projects, where, where the board wanted to do something to help young composer lyricist teams who don't have an outlet for their work right now, and winners of the Lenya competition in the past who have had their gigs canceled. So what could we come up with to help both? So we decided we'd... Uh, basically try to commission songs that would be uh, really good material for the contemporary repertoire in the Lenya competition from new uh, emerging 
uh, writers, and we would pair them with the Lenya winner to record them, and we'd, we'd make them available in songbooks uh, for use in future uh, competitions. And the response has been overwhelmingly positive from both um, cohort groups, and uh, we even got uh, this incredible jury to to make the selection of the songs with Kelly O'Hara and Andrew Whippa and Andy Einhorn, uh, another clock of them. So uh, we're really excited about this, and th this should be up on the Kurt Vile Foundation website, these new songs by, we hope, October. That's awesome. I, I'm, I hope everyone's going to take take the time to check it out. Uh, Kim, this has been delightful and fascinating. I want to end by asking you uh, one last question that I've been asking everyone, um, and that is if you could give one piece of advice uh, to your 20-year-old self, um, what would that be? Uh, probably don't let anything pass you by because you think it you might not succeed at it dare to fail i didn't dare to fail enough uh i wished i'd taken the chance of sort of grabbing at the brass ring as it as it went around sometimes so i have a few regrets that i never actually dared to to um leap without the safety net. I think I was a bit too cautious, but uh, you know, everything sort of turned out pretty exciting anyway, so I'm not complaining by any means. Right, yeah, you, you, you did a pretty, you did pretty well anyway, but that's a, that's a wonderful piece, piece of advice. Um, well, Kim Kowalki, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Off the Clock is part of our larger series, Digital Clock. Digital Clock is made possible through a generous gift from Phil and Liz Gross. If you'd like to learn more about our programming or how you can become a supporter, visit us at collegelightoperacompany.com. Tune in again next week for another episode of Off the Clock.